we're back with Representative Larry Farrell. Larry, and we were talking about um, the early release program and some of your concerns of, with it. Right. Well, as we said in the Resto case, uh, here's a gentleman that, uh, and they used a very objective standard. And, and when this bill was passed, it was supposed to be a subjective standard. What I mean by that is they looked at the criminal. Was he participating in programs, not just signing up for them, actually c successfully completing them? Did he or she have a willingness to sort of uh, mend their ways and change their life? When a, when a person comes before you, as they did with the parole in, uh, board in May of 2011, and he has such a terrible record that you deny him parole, why in God's name would you award him 199 days early release time? And that's what we did. There's something wrong with the system. Is there what, something in the statute that gives guideli uh, gu sets guidelines out for how you be subjective, how you evaluate? whether a person is likely I mean, to offend again or no what the those risk were is. those were rules and regulations that were going to be established by the commissioner of public safety excuse me of commissioner of corrections mm -hmm. and what we have now done is requested that the majority party have an informational hearing where we could question and truly understand how does this system when work when is that going to happen well they got to have they have to say yes they're the majority party we requested it yesterday yeah. and what we're basically want to find out is how does this thing work? How does a guy who, who burnt his mattress, drunk in prison, started to fights, etc., gets denied halfway house placement, gets denied parole, how do you say, but you could get out 200 days early? Well, he must have dis well, he must have displayed some sort of progress. I mean, is it, it's my understanding that doesn't the commissioner or the warden still have um, say over whether he eventually gets... Well, Lori, that was the thing that was so confusing. This is the debate I had with Representative Lawler. He said, well, you see, retroactively, he earned these things. And then he was bad, so he oh. didn't earn them for that month, but then he earned them for the next month. And I said, this is what I don't understand. If my kid, if I say to my kid, I'll give you $10 if you do your chores, and I'll put it in the bank for you, but if you misbehave, you lose the money. He could be great the first five months. If he misbehaves six months six and seven, he's losing all the money. So even though this guy might have been good for three months uh -huh. to earn the 199 days, he was terrible. The, in, in the future, you got to take it. We got to hold that over his head. There has to be a forfeiture. There wasn't. He was let out early, and this incredible, ugly crime took place. Can I talk about one of your favorite subjects? You sure can. <laughs> Money. Money. <laughs> and cutting spending. Yes. And cutting taxes. Yes. All right. Uh, cutting spending, and 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 all of that stuff. I know is, is going to come up, and it's going to be the same uh, attack that your your party is going to be making uh, in Connecticut. What about this rainy day fund stuff that just happened recently? $102 million goes in the rainy day fund. You object because this was money you said that was supposed to be used to pay down of debt. Of course, of course. Here, here's the funny part of it, Al. And, and, and the best way to put it is to compare it to what we do with our households. Picture at the end of the month, we got a, we got a kitchen table full of bills that we have to pay. $2,500, let's say. But we don't have the money. So we go to the bank and we borrow $3,000. We pay off the $2,500 worth of bills, we got $500 left. We put it in our savings account. Now, do we have the right to say, I just saved $500? I got a surplus? No, we just borrowed that money. That's what we're doing in state government. See, the problem is, we had, again, the philosophical battle of how to handle the massive problem. The governor said he was going to raise taxes to a historic level, he was going to cut spending, and he was going to achieve savings. The first thing happened, we raised taxes to $1.8 billion, largest in history. Yeah. We didn't cut spending, we increased it. All the savings we were to get from the union deals, we haven't achieved them yet. In fact, we haven't even achieved half of them yet. You put those three things together, it's a deficit. Now, the problem is, Al, we were promised that if we did take those, took that tough medicine, that shared sacrifice, as the governor said, we would be on an even keel and in surplus for five straight years. But that's, uh, it's not these, five months later and we're in deficit. Isn't the Beloit administration saying that, you know, we're, we're having better than expected revenues? No, we're having worse than expected revenues. Even they're conceding that. And they're also conceding they didn't save as much as they wanted to save. And they have to concede because their own Democratic controller is saying, we have a deficit. It wasn't supposed to be that way out. And it's that way because the one thing we did not do is cut spending. You can't spend more than you make. 
That's what we've been doing. That's why we're in the problem. So what's going to be different when the session comes around next year and we're still with the same administration? I mean, how's it going to be it different? It might be with the same administration, but um, there's an election in between, and the whole General Assembly is up. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, from what I'm hearing up there, well, I think uh, I'm very optimistic for Republicans, and uh, Connecticut Republicans, and I'll tell you why, Al. I'm talking on a state level. For the last 40 years, the Democrats have been in control of both houses for 36 of 40 years. For the first time in a generation, they now have a Democratic governor as well. We have one party rule in Connecticut. I'd like to think I'm a big enough and honest enough person to say, even if that was Republican, that is not healthy. We have one party rule in Connecticut and it is not healthy. There is not enough balance. I think people are seeing that. I think they're looking to restore balance. And when they do, in my opinion, in November, restore balance by increasing the numbers, I think you're going to see a philosophical change in the General Assembly. One that's going to insist on living within our means. One that's going to insist that we don't borrow more than we could afford to pay back. That's the kind of change I expect to happen in November and hope for in January. And you expect that we're going to be able to cut spending and cut taxes? Well, we proposed in our last session that not only did we propose cutting spending, we cut taxes by $342 uh, million. Uh, it wasn't all that was increased, but it was a start. We took the cards we were dealt in the first year of the Malloy administration, and we said, if you are committed to, and, and by the way, in doing so, we did not uh, cut a nickel of municipal funds, not a nickel worth of education funds. We have a $20 billion budget out. There's a lot of waste, not intentional, but there's a lot of waste out there. We haven't even approached trying to find out where that is. Well, Representative Farrow, I really appreciate you coming in tonight. Thank you to, for having uh, me. Appreciate it. To talk it. to us. And, uh, you know, we're going to look forward with great interest <laughs> to the election results, obviously, and then what you do with it. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a nice lot. Nice to see you. Bye now. When we come back, State Education Commissioner Stephen Pryor joins us. We'll get his take on Connecticut's new education reforms. The real story will be right back.